our next topic is reproduction. And this is a big chapter because we're going to talk about reproduction of cells all the way up to reproduction of organisms. Uh, reproduction is something that's central to the um, it, being alive, to the essence of life. Um, it comes in two general forms. There is asexual reproduction, which was definitely the first form of reproduction that uh, was probably found on Earth. And, uh, and then there's sexual reproduction, which uh, came later. Uh, asexual reproduction is where a life form just makes another life form by themselves without finding a mate. Um, there are advantages to that. The advantages of that are you don't need to go find a mate. You don't need to waste any energy finding a mate. And if you're successful, your kids should be successful. On the downside, asexual reproduction produces clones. Uh, your offspring are just like you. So since the planet is a changing uh, system, eventually the planet's going to change in such a way that there won't be enough genetic variety in the population for your population to survive, and then you'll become extinct. So asexual reproduction in the short term is, is usually an advantage, but in the long term, it's a disaster. And that's why most large multicellular organisms reproduce sexually because in the long run that's their only hope of uh, long-term uh, survival. Asexual reproduction involves binary fission which is just like a bacterial cell literally they replicate their DNA they separate it to up the replicated DNA is separated to opposite sides and then the cell splits in half. Uh, some bacteria can pull that off every 20 minutes uh, most though usually take at least you know an hour or so. Uh, mitosis, which we're going to talk about in this chapter, is how com uh, eukaryotes uh, pull off uh, cell division. And the difference is that in mitosis, you're dealing with chromosomes, which have to supercoil, then line up, and then separate, and then the cell splits in half. In binary fission, instead, you just have this like hula hoop of DNA, which replicates, and then the two hula hoops go to opposite sides, and the cell splits. It's much easier. Uh, vegetative propagation is the typical way that plants clone themselves. Um, banana trees uh, vegetatively propagate through roots. Uh, if you grow a banana in your backyard, new banana trees will sprout up nearby and, um, and spread the banana throughout your yard. Um, budding is the typical way many primitive invertebrate animals uh, grow new animals. It's sort of, sort of like vegetative propagation in plants. It's where a little growth occurs on the side of, a, of a, an anemone, and it grows into a tiny little anemone, which pops off, settles on the ocean floor, and grows up as an actual anemone. Now, all of these examples are um, cloning procedures. The last one here is fragmentation. Worms are fond of this. Uh, a bird grabs a worm. It yanks on the worm. The worm split, you know, it's pulled in half. The part of the worm that goes back down into the soil uh, grows into another worm and if the bird drops the piece that it grabbed that will also grow into another worm. Uh, sponges fragment especially in heavy surf. Uh, the wave action can smash a sponge up into pieces and then all the little pieces can grow into new sponges. So um, all of those methods have the upside of being easy, the downside of being cloning. Now as I said before in a previous unit uh, there's a limit to how big a cell can get before diffusion will no longer uh, supply the cytoplasm with uh, nutrition and exchange nutrients. So that's the surface area to volume ratio that's critical. So if you recall, what I said was that as a cell gets larger, its volume increases numerically faster than its surface area, which creates a problem. So tiny cells have no problem, but as cells get bigger, you, there are no cells in the human body that are an inch in diameter for this reason. Um, as diameter increases, surface area increases tenfold, but volume increases a hundredfold. Volume increases ten times faster than surface area. So for tiny, tiny cells that are less than a millimeter in diameter, no problem. For cells more than a millimeter in diameter, surface area to volume ratio is a problem. Basically, when the surface area to volume ratio reaches a critical value, the cell either stops enlarging or then it just divides and cuts both cells in half and that fixes the problem of uh, surface area to volume ratio. So you'll notice here, 
for a cube, if the side of a cube is one meter, the surface, the area of a face is one square meter. The total surface area of the cube is six square meters. The volume is one cubic meter. Okay, well, it sounds like six square meters can supply one cubic meter. But then let's look at and what happens here. As we move up to 20 uh, uh, meters on a side for a cube, the surface area of a meter, of a 20 meter cube, is 2,400 square meters surface area. The volume is 8,000 cubic meters. So now volume has exceeded surface area. That is the problem with um, surface area to volume ratios. This ratio is not even high enough to keep a cell alive. It needs to be more than 1,000 to 1 for a cell to stay alive. The surface area to volume ratio needs to be way bigger than 100. 1,000 should work. But anything less than that, the cell will suffocate internally. So, uh, and then this is a graph right here that's showing uh, the surface area to volume ratio uh, and how it changed. So what we have on the x-axis here is volume. And what we have on the y-axis is surface area. And you'll notice these curves are bending for these different, like here's a sphere and these are different size polyhedrons. And you'll notice that they're all curving away from the y-axis. And what that shows is that uh, volume is increasing faster than surface area by a factor of, you know, of 10 approximately. It just depends on which kind of solid you have. Now, how fast do cells grow? Well, cells can reproduce at varying rates. Some bacteria can grow amazingly fast, which makes them actually quite dangerous. They can reproduce by binary fission every 20 minutes. E. coli can do that in the human colon. So if you get bacteria in the bloodstream and your immune system's not killing them, they can overwhelm you in a matter of hours. The bacteria can be reaching numbers that are uh, outnumbering the number of cells in your body. Some bacteria, like leprosy, grow so slowly that they only reproduce every 10 to 13 days. That's sort of unusual. That's the other extreme of, of slowness. Uh, for mammalian cells, typical mitosis is about a day. So a human cell takes about a day to pull off a mitosis. Uh, but mitosis is more complicated than binary fission, as I said before. Uh, meiosis, which we're going to get to later, that's production of sperm and egg. That usually takes more than 24 hours, but usually less than 48 hours. Uh, to complete. Now, there are controls on cell division in cells. If there weren't, uh, the human body would not be possible. Generally speaking, most cells in the human body don't even divide. The only cells that do divide regularly are skin cells and bone marrow cells, which make your white blood cells and your red blood cells. Most of your other cells aren't doing cell division. So in a multicellular organism, cell growth is strictly controlled. That prevents the formation of tumors. It says, in a multicellular organism, cell growth can be turned off and on using growth factors. Now, this is where your white blood cells come in. When you cut yourself, white blood cells actually release growth factors onto neighboring cells to stimulate them to divide. And then once cell division has repaired the damaged area, the white blood cells turn off those growth factors and the... Um, uh, and the and the growth ceases. Cytokinins are the names is the, is the name of those growth factors. Cytokinins from white blood cells stimulate the production of cyclin proteins internally in uh, human cells, which then causes the human cells to go about cell division. Now, if cancer ha happens in a body, um, what's going on is the cells are growing out of control and they can't be stopped easily. Uh, right here, this is a lung that's been a section of a lung that was removed and it was cut open. And this big wide area is a squamous cell carcinoma. It's a bunch of cells that just are growing out of control and they're not doing the job of being a lung. They're not exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide for, for the patient that had that. And so that's how cancer cells can be fatal. They're your cells, you know, but they're not playing on a team. You know, the, the, your body is, an, is the most incredible team activity of cells. If you get a bunch of cells in your body that don't want to be on the team, they're going to take you down. So um, there is a huge amount of research um, that goes on every year to try and figure out how to get cancer cells under uh, control. Um, Henrietta Lacks, I should mention, who died in 1951, without her complete knowledge, donated some of her 
um, cancer cells to science and HALA cells, which is what they're called today, are still used in cell culturing to study cancer. And so HALA, Henrietta Lacks chromosomes, albeit damaged from in cancer cells, are still in laboratories around the world. Uh, and Henrietta Lacks may end up saving a lot of lives as we figure out how to stop. If we can stop HALA cells from growing in a culture dish, we might be able to stop HALA cells from growing in a human body uh, when you get a cancer. So now we've got to talk a few minutes about chromosomes. Chromosome actually means colored body. A chromosome contains DNA and protein. Human cells generally have 46 chromosomes, although you can inherit the wrong number. Uh, Down syndrome patients have 47 chromosomes per cell, but generally speaking, human cells have uh, 46. And you only see chromosomes when a cell is dividing. Uh, if a cell is not dividing, the DNA is in chromatin form. I've mentioned this before. It's loosely packed and you can't see individual uh, chromosomes at all. Now, during cell reproduction or mitosis, the chromosomes must be exactly divided or the resulting offspring cells are dead. So there is life is very unforgiving when it comes to DNA. You must have the exact quantity, no more, no less, or um, it's fatal. So the composition of chromatin, which is loosely packed DNA, is basically, first you have to understand is chromatin, which is loosely packed DNA, is what is basically found in chromosomes. Chromatins consists of DNA wound around special proteins called histones. That's what this these are right here. This blue ball right here is a polypeptide, which the DNA is wound around. The purpose of that is to kind of coil up the DNA to save space and control its activity. So the nucleosomes then wind up on top of each other like you see here and here, uh, and they form coils. Uh, and so the way these um, nucleosomes coil up the DNA is you, you can have six and a half feet of human DNA in a s nucleus of a human cell that's less than 10 nanometers in diameter, which is truly amazing. Um, so the loops and coils of DNA in the nucleus of a cell help to pack lots of DNA into a small space and control its activity. And so what you see here, here's DNA according to the Watson and Crick model. It's a spiral helix, or I should say the Franklin model. And here's how it, this then full, it loops and then folds on, coils on top of itself. And then that coils and folds on top of itself to form ultimately a chromosome structure. So a chromosome is basically two pieces of DNA. Each one is called a chromatid, chromatid, C-H-R-O-M-A-T-I-D. The connection between the two chromatids is right there. That's called the centromere. So number two is the centromere. This X-shaped structure actually consists of two identical pieces of DNA that are identical because of DNA replication. Before DNA replication, it was one piece of DNA. And now each of these pieces of DNA that are uh, overlapping each other are semi-conservative copies of each other. Remember, they're half new and half old. Uh, chromosomes actually usually have centromeres that are not quite in the middle. So these short arms sticking up uh, are referred to as the P arm, and the long section sticking down is referred to as the Q arm. So that we have a P and a Q, and a P and a Q, uh, representing two semi-conservatively copied pieces of DNA here, and the knot, which is a protein knot, right there holding the two chromatids together is called the centromere. Now, in a human cell, there are normally 46 chromosomes. Now, here's the thing. You have to understand the human uh, life cycle in terms of DNA. At conception, we get 23 chromatids from mom and 23 chromatids from dad. That's 23 sticks of DNA from mom and 23 sticks of DNA from dad. When the sperm's 23 sticks unites with the egg's 23 sticks. You end up with 46 sticks of DNA in the fertilized egg. Then, immediately, the chromatids are replicated, so they become X-shaped chromosomes. And then at cell division, 
those X-shaped chromosomes are, are separated at the centromeres so that each daughter cell will have identical DNA instructions. Uh, and then the, the next cell division takes place, and then the next cell division takes place, and that's how you built your body. You replicated your DNA when you were an embryo, and then your cells divided. And then they replicated their DNA, and then the cells divided. And then they replicate their DNA, and the cells divide, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the events that go on during the life of a cell are called the cell cycle. And the cell cycle consists of four broadly uh, defined uh, stages. There's G1, which is, stands for first gap. There's S, which stands for synthesis. It's DNA replication. Then there's G2, which is second gap. And then there's M, which is cell division or mitosis. So each of these phases takes hours. Um, and mitosis itself takes at least one hour. And it just depends on the cell as to how long it's going to take. Interphase is defined as G1S and G2 all combined. Because during G1S and G2, the cells all look the same. You can't tell them apart. You cannot look at a G1 cell and say, oh, that's a G1 cell. The, there's, the only way to test whether it's G1 would be to test the chromosomes to find out if they're replicated or not. And that would be difficult to do. During the S phase, the chromosomes get replicated. And then during G2, you have replicated DNA. Um, but that's the only difference between these cells. And you cannot see that with a microscope. You can see cells that are in M, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So interphase includes basically, again, all the events except for mitosis. Interphase is G1, which is first gap. It's the period of growth for the cell right after division. The cell enlarges as organelles uh, are, are produced to make the cell bigger. Now, the most important um, phase in a cell's life is the gap between G1 and S. That right there is called um, a checkpoint. Uh, at that checkpoint, the cell has to decide, do we want to divide or not? If it doesn't want to divide, the cell stops and drops into G0, and it just goes into maintenance and repair mode only. If the cell decides to divide, it has to enter the S phase. At that point, then, it'll go through DNA replication, which takes hours. Then, after that, it cannot stop. There's no more checkpoint. It'll go through G2, where it prepares proteins for cell division, and it does get bigger. Organelles do, again, increase in number, and tubulins, which are cell division proteins, are cranked out. Then it goes into mitosis, which is the actual period of cell division that consists of, in itself, you know, five phases, essentially, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and some biologists throw cytokinesis in with mitosis. Other biologists say cytokinesis is separate, and it's referring to division of the cytoplasm. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is the most important decision in a cell's life is right in between G1 and S, right there where the mouse is. When a cell comes around and finishes the G1 uh, phase, it has to decide if it wants to divide again, it has to go all the way around until it can come back to that same stop point. This is the only stop point. If a cell decides, hey, don't want to do this stuff anymore, it'll drop out of the uh, G1 phase into G0. And at that point, it is uh, only in maintenance and repair mode. The only way it can get out of that is if a white blood cell secretes um, stimulants, cytokinins on the cell, that will in turn cause the cell to internally produce cyclins, which will pull it out of G0 and back into G1, and then it'll go into the S phase and replicate its DNA. So what we have here is G1. This is the G1 phase right here. It's a substantial. If the whole thing is 24 hours, mitosis is usually at least an hour. This can be four to six hours right here, the first gap phase. Then there's the DNA replication phase, that's synthesis. That's another at least four to six hours or more. Then there's second gap. This is at least four to six hours or more. And then there's mitosis. And the stop point, the only place the cell can stop is right there between G1 uh, and S. So that concludes our discussion of the cell cycle. Now we move on to um, mitosis.